We are dealing with the subject of fathers today, the ideal father, and I look at what's happening in society all around us. Sometimes you get discouraged. We're living in a time of moral decay. It's not hard to see the many problems that we are being faced with all around us. Crime, lack of respect, devaluing of human life. And while that is true, the remedy is not, is not to be found in our government. It is and has been and will continue to be because of the breakdown of the traditional family. And until we reestablish that, until we go back to the basis of what God intended for the family to be, we will not see our nation, this world, become what it ought to be. Fathers are no longer being fathers. Mothers are no longer being mothers. The family is broken. And it's time that the fathers get back into the life of their children and to lead them in the way of God. And I say this, failure is not an option. We have to do better. And while you may be saying, well, I'm not a father yet, or I have been a father and, and I am a grandfather now, you still have a responsibility. And the, the Word of God gives us the, the guidelines of what we ought to be doing and how we ought to be responding. And so I ask today, and this message is primarily to fathers, but it pertains to all of us as individuals who want our lives to be better. I ask you this question, do you, do you want a better life? Now I say that because I realize that many of the young children or even the young adults have come from broken families and, and it's been devastating on them and they just can't get over what has happened in their lives. But I'm here to tell you things can get better if you want it to be better. Do you want a better you? Do you want things better for your children or your grandchildren? And it begins with you taking the initiative and start making some changes in your own lives. And I've got a couple of passages of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. And Ephesians 6, 4, and then Luke chapter 15. Now, we're not going to take the time today to read all of uh, verse 11 through verse 32. That's something for you to do. But I'm going to make some points and some highlights in regards to that, in regards to the, the prodigal father. We all, we all, all, the prodigal, uh, yeah, the prodigal father of that prodigal son. And uh, when we look at it, we're going to begin to see that what's happening is to be an ideal father, there are some characteristics that we need to have that we're not having in this culture. And it's characteristics that is not only to be in the life of a father, but in the life of an individual who wants a better life for them and the ones behind him. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Now this is what he begins to say to fathers because he uses the words husbands. Now here's the key. If we want to begin, this is what, what God begins to say to us. Husbands, love your wives. Now we can stop right there and we can preach how uh, the concept of love for the, the wives has just dwindled down where they are just taken advantage of and used and discarded just constantly. We can talk about that. But this is the concept of what God begins to say that fathers, you need, you need to be what God wants you to be. And that is in the area of being loving towards your wives. And your children pick up whether you are loving towards your wife, your spouse, or not. They are uh, aware of that. So husband, loves your, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, this is a, a unique type of love. This is the agape love of where you're just willing to lay down everything for your spouse, for your, your, your wife, or your husband in that case. And when we begin to see that, this is the establishment of getting us back to where we need to be. Now, if you will look at Ephesians chapter 6, 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Now, this is the concept of taking it from. It begins with how you are treating your, your, your wife, how you are responding to them. Then in verse 4, it says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So this is what we begin to see is there is biblical responsibilities that fathers have. You are to love your wife. You are to raise your children in a way that leads them to have an understanding of God, not a surface understanding. You can read your Bible in front of your children, but if you're not living it, then you are being nothing more than a mere hypocrite. And we are aware of, of the problems in our society today. But let's talk about some of the facts about children. And I'm not a, a I guess I would not classify myself as a scholar, but I do know these facts about children, and what we begin to realize is children are a part of being a father. You become a father when you have children. Now let me say this, that you can be a father and never have had children. You can be a father to those around you, the younger generation. You can have, have them as individuals who you are mentoring and helping them and encouraging them and being them, there for them in all aspects of their life as they begin to mature. And some of the questions they may have, they may feel free uh, to come to you. So let's get some of these facts about children. And when we go into Luke chapter 15, we'll talk about that. So that's where we're going next. But let me get some of these facts uh, of, out to you. Number one is they don't, children, that is, children don't come with instructions. Did you know that? When, my, when our children were born, I looked, there was no instruction sheet on the foot of my child. Each one was different. Matter of fact, when uh, Sandy and I uh, uh, got married and on, and, and a couple years later, Valerie was born, and then uh, a couple years later, Justin was born, after Justin was born, Sandy made the comment, I want another daughter. She didn't want somebody like Justin because Justin was totally different than uh, what Valerie was. I mean, you talk about somebody that uh, just kind of giggled about doing some crazy things. He probably still does, but he, he was different than Valerie. And so Sandy says, oh, you know, I'll be glad if I can have another daughter. And, and, and she did, and lo and behold, she found out that the daughter, Rebecca, when Rebecca was born, Rebecca come out and Rebecca was not like Valerie. Rebecca was more like Justin. And those two just, I guess, made it a situation in our family that uh, we never knew what was going to happen. And then uh, Jordan comes along. So all of them, are, I'm just here to say that your children don't come with instructions and the talent that one child has, the other child may not have. The ability that that child has may not be the same as your other children. So don't try to put them all into a mold because it's not going to work. You're going to have some strong battles that you begin to realize. So your children, the fact is, children don't come with instructions on how and which way you are to, 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 to lead them other than in the Word of God. We understand that. So the second thing that I have found, facts about children, and this has been going on for generation after generation after generation, is that children ask a lot of questions. You ever notice that? Um, our children did. I know my nephew did to Sandy's dad, but why, but why? You ever hear that, but why, but why? They, they wanna know why, and you tell them why, and then what's the next thing they ask? But why? You explain it to them, but why? And that concept goes on and goes on and goes on. It's something about a child where they're wanting to know a little more information. And sometimes you're like, hey, don't ask why no more. Uh, we even have that in the life of our grandchildren where they have gone through that stage of asking, but why? But why? And you sometimes just say, because I said so. You ever said that to your child? Yeah, we do sometimes. 
But they do ask a lot of questions, so you better be prepared for it. You, you need to understand some of the questions they are going to ask are going to be easy questions. Some of the questions that they're going to ask are going to be hard questions. So that is a fact about children. They are inquisitive. They want to know. They have a, a hunger. There's just something about they want to learn. And, and so just be patient with them. Uh, thirdly, is these individuals, we know facts about children, is they must be trained. Did you know your child, no matter how much you wish, your child didn't come out walking, did they? Your child was very dependent upon you to carry, to take, to feed. That child didn't know how to feed itself. I mean, it's just, they need to be trained. And so you've got to somehow invest your time as a father, as a mother, as a, an aunt, an uncle, you got to invest your time in the area of helping to train that child to learn new things, to explore new things. And that is, the, they have that inquisitiveness in them and they, they must be trained, they must be taught how to do things. I recall um, teaching our, our children, basically one of the responsibilities I had was teaching them how to ride bicycles. You ever taught somebody how to ride a bicycle? You know how to teach somebody how to ride a bicycle. You actually get them on the bicycle. Now, what I did was very unique. Uh, most people go from, from uh, what they call a tricycle to bicycle with, what's those things on the back? Training wheels? You remember the training wheels? Well, big like I am, I said, I'm not gonna teach my children to go from a tricycle to a bicycle with training wheels. So I never taught my children how to ride a bicycle basically with training wheels. We went from the tricycle and the tractors that they used to have and ride on, uh, we went right to the bicycle stage. But being a good father that I am, I'm going to take that child, put them on the bicycle, very small bicycle, and I'm gonna you know, run beside it and, and help them out. You ever done that? You, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, when you finally, as an adult, you get tired of running, what do you do? You stop and you watch your child finally make their way. But one thing I forgot to teach my children is there's brakes to the bicycle. And uh, our oldest one had the tendency where she would be going and she, she, you know, I would give out and she would keep going and she would just run into the bushes or, run, you know, jump off the bicycle at the bicycle crash. But what I'm trying to say is they've got to be trained. They learned, eventually they learned how to use brakes and, and all the other good things. And so, I, I, you know, but what I'm saying is they've got to be trained. And then I realized something about our children and about children in general, just be around children. You're gonna learn something that that child, uh, basically, that child knows you better than other people know you. You know what I'm talking about? Those things that you don't let anybody else see, they see. They see you and I'm going to say it in, in this terms, they, your children, see you at your worst. They see you when you're not putting on the face. They see you when you're not at church. They see how you respond when the lawnmower doesn't start. They see how you respond when things don't go according to, pl to, to the plans that you had. Do you lose it? Do you somehow just uh, start using profanity and, and fail to be that? You see, your children know you better than others. They know those hidden secrets. They are so aware of them and uh, how true that is. They know you better than others. And then one of the things I also learned about the facts about children is that they imitate what they see. Is that true? You bet. If you ever get the privilege to work in a nursery and tend to children, you'll begin to see that children are starting to develop imitating their parents. The things that their parents do, these children will start doing. And so we begin to see and understand that they imitate what they see. So be careful in that. And then finally, the facts about children, I have learned this, is that they grow up. And they grow up too fast sometimes. And, well, let's move on. I want to talk about a godly father. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, what we read is pointing us to being a godly father, a father who takes the initiative, a father who trains their child, a father who is uh, giving their child an ultimate direction in life that is the word of God because people, nothing is, be it is better to give your child than the word of God. If they see it in your life, they can begin to retain it. So what we begin to see is that we are to raise our children, the godly father, we are to raise children with the knowledge of right and wrong. You are to teach your, your son, your daughter, that if they do right, that's appreciated. You know, talk when they do something good, tell them they did something good. Don't just get on them when they do something wrong. They acknowledge the good things. Bring them out, point them out, and it will begin to make a difference. So you need to raise your children with knowledge of right and wrong. That's what uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 is talking about. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teach them what right is. Teach them what wrong is. Teach them that they're going to have difficult times. Teach them that God will be with them if they'll commit their lives to Him all the time. So we begin to see and understand that very important truth. And then I want you to go back to Luke chapter 15. I told you we would be coming there in just a moment. In Luke chapter 15, there's some other concepts of what we need to realize in the area of a godly father is in Luke chapter 15, we find out that this, this individual, this father, he had two children. Here's, here's what we began to see. Luke chapter 15, uh, verse, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had Two sons. Now stop right there. Two sons. Let me ask you, the ideal father, the perfect father, the father that we ought to be modeling our life after has two sons. Which son does he love the most? Well, he loves the oldest because the oldest carries on his name and, you know, everything gets to a greater portion goes to the old, according to the Old Testament. Well, the truth is, look at verse 12. This is the way the father responds to these two sons. And, he, and, and the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Here's the father's love. He divided unto them his living. Does the father love the first son? Yes, absolutely. Well, if the father loves the first son, and actually this is the younger one, if the father loves the first son, what about the older son? Well, let's look at what the Bible and the whole passage begins to reveal to us. Go with me down to verse 31. This is after the, the younger son comes back, after the problem arises between the, the younger and the older son. And this is what the father begins to acknowledge here. He said unto him, the oldest son, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. So which one does he love better? He loves them equal, don't he? He's willing to give. And when he gives to that individual his son, so the love that the father has is there and it's equally distributed to all children. One of the questions that we had as young uh, uh, parents was how will we be able to love each child equally? Let me tell you something. It is doable. It is possible. You don't have to have a favorite child because each child is unique, different. And they will continue to be that way because that's the way God, God has a sense of humor on the family in regards to it. But sec, uh, thirdly, in the area of the godly father, is this individual provides for children and his household. Now look with me at verse 17. Because in verse 17, we are established with this godly father, the illustration that Jesus is given. And he says, and when he came to himself, that is the younger one who is there. He, he spent all of his money. He's down there with the pigs and the slop and all that. And it says in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? So let me say this, that a godly father is a father who provides for his household. 
provides for his children, provides for all in his household. And that concept of providing for the household is seen here by this individual taking care of his servants. The ones who work for him are well taken care of. They have, according to what is said here, is they have plenty, it says, they have enough and to spare, verse 17 there, and I perish with hunger. He says, there's a lot of food back there at my dad's table that is being thrown away. My dad prepares a table. My father prepares a table for everyone within his household and even the servants, and they have plenty, and there is food being thrown away. Don't we do that here in America? Yes. I know individuals who say that they never eat leftovers. Well... You know, that's not my household. We eat leftovers. And, and there's nothing wrong. There's food. And, and when we have food, we take care of one another. And then when you begin to look in the concept of the godly father, the godly father is an individual who is, allows his children to make bad choices. Boy, don't you wish you could make every choice for your son and daughter? Well, you'd make the right choice, wouldn't you? You would choose, I mean, let's go back to the biblical, you would choose who they marry and who they didn't marry. You know, you, you would be re involved in her life in every aspect. Well, let me, let me educate you. A father needs to allow their children to make bad choices. Every one of us who look back over our past, we look at the bad choices and we've learned a lot from our bad choices, Amen. They have taught you many things. They have brought many heartaches to us as individuals. So a godly father is a person who will step back and say, you know, that's your decision. You make the decision. I can't make it for you. Well, this is what the, the, the younger son comes to the dad and says, Dad, uh, you're getting old. Dad, I, I don't want to be around here any longer. Dad, I want you to give me what's, what's due me. You know what many fathers would do today? Just say, get out, son. You got the clothes on your back. But this father says, no, I'll divide and I'll give you what's yours. And you can do whatever you choose. Wow. That's love the father has. We see that. But see, he allows children to make bad choices. How bad of choices can you make? Well, you got the money, and people who think that money is going to bring the satisfaction and the joy in their lives are going to wake up one day and find out that the money did not bring the joy in their life because they squandered it on things that is ungodly. Isn't that what happens here? We see that, that the younger son, he goes out, he takes his journey to a far country, verse 13, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You know what he did? He indulged himself. He saw this, he wanted it, he bought it. He, he, he wasted his money in the area of worldly pleasures. And let me tell you something, worldly pleasures will rob you of heavenly joy. And it's sad that many people think that worldly pleasures is going to benefit them and it's going to bring all the joy. But here is a godly father who says, I know my son, my daughter is going to make bad choices and they need to be given that freedom to make bad choices. Now, That leads us to the next in the area of a godly father. A godly father does not expect his children to be perfect. Do you know why I can't expect my children to be perfect? Because I'm not. I'm doing the best that I know how. And if I know that there's times that I stumble and I fall, and I'm not doing everything that I ought to, how in the world can I expect them to be perfect? Jesus was the only one who was perfect, and we understand that. So a godly father is a person that does not expect his children to be perfect. By the way, which of the two of his children were perfect? Neither one. The one, the younger one, he wasn't. The older one, when his brother comes back, 
He has jealousy, anger, bitterness, resentment. So neither one was perfect. So, does not expect his children to be perfect. But also we know that a godly father, while he doesn't expect his children to be perfect, understands that his children are going to make mistakes and are going to make bad choices. But a godly father is an individual who forgives them unconditionally. That is the forgiveness that we need to give. A father, a, 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 a mother is an individual who needs to be there and have that unconditional love that goes out to these individuals when they mess up and when they acknowledge their wrongdoing. That's it. They need to acknowledge their wrongdoing. And when they acknowledge their wrongdoing, there is that concept of unconditional love. We see that in verse 22, where the, the younger son comes back to the father. And, and he says, you know, I'm going to come back to my father and I'm going to beg to be a servant. But in verse 22, it says, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. In other words, let's bring him back to an elevator. Let's make him new. We don't want him to be the same old person. We want him to be something new. And it is the forgiveness of unconditional love that we see here distributed to, to the, the, the son in, and, and, and this situation. And then we also realize that a godly father is always concerned for their well-being. Now let me ask you something, parents. When do you stop worrying about your children? Never. Our children have been old and moved out of the home for many years. But you know something? We still worry about them. When they're on the road traveling, we, we, we like to know. It's not that we're nosy. We like to know because we like to be in prayer for the safety we know how, how bad it is out here driving. There's some nuts on the road. Did you know that? Crazy people. And we're a part of that sometimes. But we're concerned for their well-being. We're concerned for their safety. And I see this father as an individual who as he gave to the younger son, he was concerned he was wondering, he was longing, he wanted to know what was going on. He wanted to somehow see the, the point in which that child turned back to the area of what he, he knew that his son was doing wrong. He was aware of that. He had servants, and I'm sure that he got reports of what was going on in regards to the life of his son. And that is the concern that we have. How do we know this guy was concerned for his child? Because what we find in Scripture in verse 20, when the son is coming there in verse 19, and, and, and uh, he says, And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20, he arose and he came to his father. We see that. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is compassion. This is concern. This is my son who has squandered it all has finally come to his senses and come home. Come back to what he left many years ago. He left the security. He left the presence of the father who provided and took care of him. And yet now the, the, the concern is there and the father just says, he loves him. You'll never stop being concerned for your children, nor should you. You say, well, they're growing up. You know, I kicked them out of the house many years ago, so I, have, I haven't talked to my son. You know, if we're, I, aren't you concerned? Well, no, I, you know, they're old enough. They can fly. If they can't fly, you know, that's their problem. The biblical concept is that we are to love our children as God loves the church. And if that's the case, we need to be Loving constantly. Well, let's look at God. And I want to take the next few moments and look at God as being the best father. Now, I'm talking about our Heavenly Father. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about the creator of all things. 
And when we look at this area of the, the creation and the concept of how God is the best father, this is, this is a parable that Jesus has given and he's sharing and he, he's uh, talking about this and he's illustrating to us that there is someone who loves you no matter who you are. And that is the concept that God loves everybody. You are loved. It doesn't matter if you are right now living, squandering your life and wasting and, and turned your back upon God and running in the wrong direction. You need to understand that God still loves you. You may not love God, but God loves you. Now, how can that be? Because we know when you get over to 1 John, we know that God is love. That's the character of God. He loves all of us. And not only does he love those who are living in sin because he provides a way back, he loves those within the church who have stayed and, and are living for him and are established in him and rooted in him. He loves us as well, the younger and the older son. God loves all individuals. Secondly, in the area of God being the best father is that he allows us to make bad choices. Let me just point blank, just hit you right between the eyes. Have you ever made a bad choice? Yes, is the correct answer. We all somewhere have made bad choices and it has led to consequences that we face and are still present in our lives today. And so what God does, the best father, is he chooses to love us in spite of the bad choices that we have made. And yet he continues to love us in the bad choices and praying and waiting for the day that we come out of that when we come to our senses. Isn't that what happened to this young individual where we began to see that he is an individual? And it says, and when verse 17, and when he had come, to himself, when he had come to the point of realization, when he had come to the, the point of looking nowhere but up, he had hit rock bottom, is what we began to see here, is that he begins to see and he begins to find the need to go back to the Father. And that's what individuals do in our lives. But God allows us to make bad choices. And then we know that God is concerned for your well-being. We know that. He does for you, He does for me, what we cannot do. God's concerned for your well-being. God, God cares about you. We often think that only God cares about sinners. God doesn't just care about sinners. He cares about all people. God cares about you. He knows everything about you. There's nothing that you have hidden from Him. Go back to Genesis. We began to see that. It was Adam and Eve who were hiding from God and God knew where they were, but God confronted them in the area of where art thou and, and, and they finally come out. You see that response? They come out and then God knew that, but they needed to make that decision to come out. And so he is concerned for their well-being. And then we know that God, the best father ever, always welcomes us back to him. Go over to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't stop there. And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You see, he always, God, God always welcomes us back. You have an opportunity to come back to God, but it's your opportunity. Now you can squander it, you can stay wallowing with the, with the pigs as long as you want to, but there's coming a day, if you stay with the pigs, you're going to remain with the pigs the rest of your life. And then when you die, it's even going to be worse. You're going to say, oh, I wish I was still wallowing with the pig so I could get out of that pig pen. But once you die, your eternity is set, which brings us to the fact that God, the best father, offers us a better life. Wow. When does he offer us the better life? Well, obviously we could say, well, heaven's going to be better than this. But let me say something. My eternity started the day I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I may have ups and downs in this lifetime, but let me say this, it's better with Jesus than without Jesus. Because He walks with me. 
And so he offers us a better life now and in the future. Staying like we are will never bring about the change we need. You don't get better doing nothing. You don't. Think about it. You want to get better? You don't get better doing nothing. You've got to do something to start the change. Change starts with each of us here today. And how much do you love your children? Do you love them enough to make the change needed in your own life? It is time to make change. And then I ask, are you letting God change you? Are you willing to let God change you? Because the changes that you make yourself may only be temporary, but what God makes is permanent. I want to be a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather that my children look at and grandchildren and great-grandchildren look at and say, I know, I know that he loved the Lord. There's no doubt in their minds. You can ask my children. Dad's not perfect. But they know how much I love the Lord. And they have seen me in situations where most individuals, fathers, would have lost it. And they know that I'm rooted upon the principle of God's knowledge of bringing salvation and a new life to me. They know that. Do your children know that about you? Are you letting God change you? Let's pray. Father, help us to realize in your word we are challenged, challenged to live for you, to surrender our lives to you. Basically, what we begin to see and realize that we as individuals need to turn from you, turn from our sinful ways and turn to you in that concept. We need to realize time is running out. And we need to come back to you. As the prodigal father said, the younger son was dead but now is live again. The younger son was lost and now is found. And there is great rejoicing over one individual who repents and comes to you. And I pray for that heart, that individual, to turn to you in the name of Christ. Amen.